Welcome to the Waiting List Podcast. Tell us a story. It's like many things you start building from, from scratch. And then I'm like, wait, I really do like watches because... You, you've seen so many watches that makes you I, excited. Yeah, I think I really, really do like watches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's a great way to see if you are a watch enthusiast. Okay, welcome to the Waiting List Podcast, where I, Daniel, am joined with Jacqueline and Lung Lung. Alex is still recovering from his uh, James Bond roasting on the Christmas special. I uh, admittedly on listening back, I did kind of like absolutely barbecue him. So anyway, I've allowed him a week off to lick his wounds. You did. For quite a while now, I've uh, talked about doing more collector orientated podcasts and giving like watch industry celebrities uh, perhaps a break. You know, actually, in fact, uh, many people have reached out on my Instagram and said, like after after talking to them, they give me the feedback that they'd actually like to listen to more collectors. Um, in light of that, today I'm joined by a fellow Shanghai Watch Gang member, a real stalwart who never misses the gathering. Actually, you did miss the last gathering because you were with a maid, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, since he arrived in Shanghai, he's Jack Hu, literally Jack Hu. So welcome, Jack. Hi. Welcome. Welcome. Okay, so enthusiastic. Thanks. <laughs> I tried to. We, we we warned you. You better sound better than that, <laughs> right? I uh, don't know when this episode will air because we've got a whole lot of content yet to be released. But actually, this is our first recording of 2021. So, how was New Year for everyone? Because I think to some extent we all dropped off the radar. And actually, this is the first time I'm talking to Jacqueline and Lono in the new mm. year so mm. Jacqueline you know how's it been how has it been oh yeah so yeah happy new how year, was new guys. year um it was it was okay it was it was pretty eventful um my friend and I we went out a lot uh and by meaning went out literally out in the wilderness and not like um trying to infect people or get infected but with that being said like it was uh it was a little bit of a, a roller coaster because we felt kind of sick right after new year's um so we both went and got tested um not, not from alcohol no 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 no. sorry uh from like we we felt like we had runny noses and some headaches i know for myself i was like trying to um avoid bright lights because every time i go outside into like a supermarket with really bright lights i would get a really bad headache so then i told my friend i was like this is not normal and it turned out like one of our closer friends from new york just got tested for positive so then we were just freaking out by ourselves and then we were like yeah fuck it we're, we're gonna go and get tested and then we got the results um like two days later and like thank that we were tested negative um but now like just 20 minutes ago uh, we were on a phone call with the friend who got tested positive and she was like oh yeah um for the first two days if you get tested for the COVID test it might not be accurate so then we're like oh I don't know but I feel much better than you know a few days ago so um aside from that we had a very like chill and jai um new year's and then yeah just spent a lot of time with our cats that's it okay yeah cats with you? an s yeah oh yeah we why we, uh, why have cats with an s okay well oh wait does dad not know this no no you only you okay saw. you can yeah okay um okay, so go. so uh we felt that like luca was getting a little bit lonely and then we were a little bit scared that he was gonna get social like anxiety or have social awkwardness so then we tried to bring in another kitty uh which is a chocolate kitten um and then they're just trying to get along right now we don't know if it's gonna work out but um yeah okay how about you long long how was your how was um, your new year and everything i did like the most chinese thing so we had like mala hot pot and one of those places where you just line up for like two hours mm. and then um after that we went to the casino <laughs> and then we played so, baccarat so i did the countdown like at the baccarat table it, it was strange because it's like social distancing, right? Yeah. So you have maximum three people per table. And the whole point of Baccarat is you have to like collectively have that energy to like change the card, you know? But then it's like three people and you can't even like lean close to be like, you know how you want to look at the other person's mm. card to like help them, like help them, right? Mm -hmm. um, you couldn't do that. So you have to like space out and then you can't even have people too close to you from the back. 
And then sometimes uh, like back in the days, like say the minimum bet is say it's a hundred, right? Mm. Um, some people will take a 25 chip and put it on top because they don't want to bet a hundred. So you can't even have other people place their chips on top. Oh. So usually, yeah, a lot oh, of people so don't want to hit the minimum. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. and then also like ride that luck. Like if you're on a street, right? So basically it's like literally three players, like other people can't come in. And it was strange because even when you're trying to play with your friends, you have to be like really one meter apart. You can't mm. even like move your seat closer. You can't drink water. Uh, you can't even put the bottle of water here, like on the table. Why, why, Wait, can't, why you can't you drink water? water? I don't know. Because um, you're wearing masks. I don't know. Because yeah, yeah, you got to take off your mask and drink. Yeah. But then you can drink the water if you go to the slot machines. Mm. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Mm. Well, did you um, win anything? Yeah. How was it? I didn't win. And then, so I was, so this is my theory. So I'm very superstitious when it comes to gambling, right? Mm. And then the market opens at like 10 30 PM for us. Like we, a lot of me and my friends trade us stocks, right? So we were standing there before we went in and then the market was super good that day. And then we were like, should we sell? And then all of them didn't sell, but then I got greedy and I was like, I'm going to sell. So you guys go in. And then I sold. So in my head, I, I thought, okay, like I already made money. So God is like, you're not going to make more money inside the casino because yeah. you made money outside. Yeah. So that's my theory. Like, so I didn't make money inside, but like my friends who didn't sell, like they were opening like, so Baccarat to win is like eight and nine, right? They were opening eight, nine, eight, nine, eight, nine. And then every time I went and I was like, I'm going to bet the same thing as you. Like they lost that hand. <laughs> so I said to them, I'm not betting, I'm leaving. And then um, when I left, obviously, it was really hard to get a cab. But that was my night, you know, yeah. gambling. <laughs> yeah. And how about you, Jack? <laughs> what did you do? Wait one second. I went to a New Year Eve party. And then we were playing Mahjong and like Do Di Zhu mm. until like 6 a.m. I went home and then I went to have lunch and dinner with uh, some other friends the next day so i was like totally didn't sleep for like two mm. days straight pretty much <laughs> right but yeah I, uh... it was pretty funny like I, I we had a friend who was losing so much money uh before like, like during 2021 <laughs> but as soon as the clock hits 12 he started winning and like every time I met him, he's still winning. Like since 2021, he hasn't lost a single time. <laughs> okay, technically Chinese people, like our New Year's uh, hasn't started though. No. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah. but it is normally like it, it, your luck doesn't just change on the new year. It, it, it's a great It does. <laughs> okay. I'm going to go to the casino again. I'm going to the casino again for Chinese New Year. When is Chinese New Year? It's in February, right? <laughs> I have yeah. no idea, but but I'm gonna take it more seriously because I wasn't like I was um one I over eight and then secondly so I was like drowsy and then secondly I wasn't even dressed to like win right and my friend was wearing Wait, red like she was so into wear? it she even wore a... what do you have to wear oh, I'm so like over the top probably like, red underwear to... or something yeah like red underwear bra like blinked out like jewelry everything right my friend was wow. so superstitious that um. She said to me, hey, bring a shower cap for me. This is at dinner. What? And I was like, why? And she was wearing a shower cap when we were eating hot pot. And then I was like, what are you <laughs> doing? <laughs> She's like, I'm not going to have smelly hair. And she was like wearing red, like so into it. And I was like, if she makes money like this, right? I am going to wear fucking goggles, like shower cap, everything. I'll do anything. <laughs> so the next time we go, I'm going to be like decked out, like all jewelry red head to toe everything i'm just gonna pull out all so the did stops. she actually win yeah she did she was like okay. on a streak i was amazed <laughs> wow. i guess that yeah. works <laughs> yeah. uh, well uh yeah i don't gamble so i didn't do any gambling I've, I've never actually yeah i've never gambled yeah i don't think i have um but uh prior to actual new years yeah i was just so busy with with meetings like social gatherings and the whole thing and you know china doesn't really stop so there's no holiday you know mm. uh for christmas all the way to new year's and new year's is just that one day because it's yuan dan mm. and then uh, so you're kind of like 
doing the social thing like you'd normally do for Christmas and New Year's, but then you're actually working as well. So it's like, oh my God, it's so much more. I was just shattered. I was completely mm-hmm. shattered. So actually on New Year's, actually someone did invite me to a thing like they, they rented a, I don't know, <laughs> I rented a hotel or something, or like a suite or something. Sounds and said, dodgy. Hey. Yeah, right. It actually <laughs> sounds exactly the thing I would like to yeah. go to. Right? <laughs> like, hotel suite. I saw the bed. Yeah. I was like, hmm, yeah. okay. <laughs> but uh, I was like, oh, I'm so tired. And I just made up an excuse, said I, I'm, I'm spending it with family. And I did actually spend it with, uh, with family. Mm. So but I, I, in turn, I didn't feel like Jack, which was like totally knackered. So I started on the, the first really kind of fresh. fresh. Mm. And um, that actually goes on to my next question, which, uh, you know, did you guys have any like New Year resolutions? All right, mm. don't don't jump at it all at the time. And the reason why I say it is because I started off January not really thinking, right, I'm going to do this, 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 this. It kind of just happened, maybe because I did have a few days there where I actually had my own time. And I th- and it just, I just, things happened. And I think, okay, if these things are happened, then I'm going to try and maintain these things. So uh, one of the things that I've started doing is um, when I wake up, I do like half an hour stretching Mm. and then when I go to sleep uh, before I go to sleep. So my, my sleep routine has totally changed. So my phone goes down, I start reading a book and then when my eyes get tired, reading a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So once I, once my eyes get tired, I stick on the audio book. And then when I get tired with that, I then put that down and then I go to sleep and then I stretch. (laughs) (laughs) No, no, I've totally gone off porn. I'm totally off porn. That's, that, that was like last year's kind of resolution. So, yeah, you can tell I'm totally honest. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Dude, last year, there was a lot of talk about porn. I mean, I can still talk about it. Like, that's all. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm still an expert at it. <laughs> yeah. I, yes, I know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so I started doing stretching in the morning, stretching in the evening, just before I go to bed. It actually happens when I'm listening to the podcast, mm-hmm. so I'm not wasting time. And then I and then I fall into sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, and then another thing um, was, okay, so I started, as you said, I was like reading. Yeah, so I started reading a lot, right? And so I started talking to Alex because I was like looking for books to read, like mm-hmm. good books to read. So mm-hmm. I said, to, and it just naturally came where, okay, you know, two guys, they get competitive and they say, uh, okay, like how many books are you going to read this year? <laughs> how many books are you going to read this year? So mm-hmm. Alex said to, Alex said, he's looking to do about 30 books this year. So mm-hmm. I said wow, to him, okay. I want to get, I want to do one book a week, right? Irrelevant, like mm-hmm. on how long the book is. Or, or how short the book is. It's going to be average about one book a week. Mm. Yeah. And he says, I mm-hmm. can't compete with that. Yeah. And I was like, okay, why don't we set the target? So you hit the target and I hit the target. It doesn't matter the fact that it's different. Mm. Yeah. And then it got into a different thing where we actually, I actually think it's quite good. Instead of competing against each other, we said, okay, if we both reach that target, we will get something to commemorate mm. that mm. together. But if any of if you don't reach that target or I don't reach that target or both of us don't, we, neither of us neither of us get it. So he set the target to thirty one, and I've kept my target at fifty two. And oh, wow. uh, I actually finished a book on New Year's, which I actually started last year, uh, called The Charisma Myth. And mm. yeah, he said I can't include that, <laughs> right? So I'm already like You're such a sore loser. <laughs> yeah. So so I, I I'm in three books in. I think uh, like by the weekend, I'll, I'll be maybe four books in, like four books done. I'm, I'm finishing a book soon. Uh, so I, I think I'm like roughly on target, but I mean, it's only January. So I'll, I'll try and I'll try and uh, keep that kind of. Mm. Wait, it's been one week and you're four books in. Are you mm. reading yeah. like kids graphic novels or some shit? <laughs> like those ones that has like 10 pages. <laughs> I just feel totally roasted there. But I mean, <laughs> no, the thing is, is right. I, I actually don't read just one book at a time. So oh, I'm reading three too. books. I'm reading three books at a time and I'm reading like a, a finance book, 
I'm reading a, a watch book, which is a Patek book. Mm. And I read um, kind of self-development books. So that's three different genres because I don't want to just stick to to one uh, like genre. So, But these three started since the new year. Yeah. yeah. And you finished all of them. Mm-hmm. Yes, Jack, I have finished all of them. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I read the last lecture. I started that on New Year's Day. I finished that on the second. I Very read short book. Uh, uh, Netflix. Uh, what's it called? Um, that will never work. That took about three, four days. Um, I'm reading a book called Daring Greatly right now, which is about uh, vulnerability and mm. accepting your vulnerability and that kind of stuff. So I finished that in a week, uh, no, in a day or two, I reckon. Mm. Um, and then after that book, because once you read this quickly, you've got to have the books lined up because mm. you waste time mm. looking for books, right? So mm-hmm. I've got like sleep ordered. Mm. So it's already arrived. Mm-hmm. And the um, Out of the Gobi. But Out of the Gobi mm-hmm. is a, it's a heavy book. Like mm-hmm. when I mean heavy, it's like not only long, but it's mm-hmm. mentally heavy. Mm-hmm. So it's, I don't know how... Uh, but um, yeah, I've been reading the Patek book and the yeah. Patek book is so good. It's so good. Yeah. I love it. By Nick Fox. Uh, huh? By Nick Fox. Yeah, by Nick Fox. So I read 25 pages a day on that book. Yeah. I mean, it's not too hard because a lot of, there's a lot of pictures. Yeah. Um, so in that respect, Jack, yeah, I do have some books with a lot of pictures, <laughs> but still I can reach more than 10 pages a day. Yeah. I can do 25 and then reading that book is an absolute joy. Like mm. it's because from page one, I was learning something new I didn't know, right? Mm. And you can't really say that about, I mean, the book I'm reading now about vulnerability, yeah, uh, it's so wishy-washy. I can't even put my, you know, it's one of those books where you can't really put your hand on anything. You're like listening to all yeah. these things and you think, what are you even talking about? Like, mm. can you talk about anything mm. in substance? Mm. It's one of those books. I'm just going to get through it um so yeah so reading um i want to get through 52 books uh Can you start a book club? <laughs> i don't know i'm not, I'm not I'm even still joking a, I'm, still, I'm still a novice at this kind of thing man like you know i am so i just want to mm. uh just to be honest it sounds kind of selfish but mm. i want to focus on myself mm. you know um, that's fucking really... selfish <laughs> <laughs> I did another thing, I think, uh, which was a, a thing from last year, which I told Long Long as well, is I really cut my social media time down to 15 mm. minutes a day, mm. right? Um, like sitting on so, the toilet, right? No, I don't even, I don't even touch it on the toilets, you know? <laughs> I don't even take it to the toilet. I, I, have, I have toilet reading books. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Can you recommend? Uh, you some laugh. Of them? Yeah, yeah. I'll. I'll, yeah. I'll uh, send you photos of it. Like, yeah. it's, don't read your actually... paddock book on the toilet, though. I don't. Because I might you have to read that afterwards. Of course, he's afraid that he's gonna get the pages. Smell bad. He doesn't want the the pages no. to be stinky. <laughs> the the paddock yeah, exactly. book. Yeah. <laughs> the paddock book. Um, is, it's it's like so important to me mm. you know one it's a gift one you know how much i love watches mm. uh, it's not a cheap book no um you know i really take care of that book yeah uh, you know jack wants to borrow it and i'm like if you if anything happens to that book you're buying me a new one <laughs> yeah right? like if a page is like, slightly ripped you're buying me a new one i'm not even going to quite to it to it i haven't told him but i might as well tell him now i'm not quite <laughs> it to you you are coming over to pick that book up yourself and then you're going yeah that's like, a long no... trip dude <laughs> huh? that's that's so far yeah well well that's that, that's the only way i'm doing it like okay. it's such a special I might as well book pick for me. up the kari and the ap books too then <laughs> well yeah when i'm done with them i don't think the kari book's going to take that long to get through and the uh, ap complication pictures? book uh yeah it's, it's even more heavily on pictures than that's why you probably might like it yeah <laughs> uh, like but uh the ap book since you're such a geek and look, look like looking at numbers you probably get an orgasm mm. over that mm. um so yeah those are the books i'm kind of reading i think that's pretty much it so social media as you guys probably have noticed on the uh the Instagram is 
when I'm going to the gym, I'm clocking it in and clocking it out. So mm. I thought like I might as well use peer pressure from Instagram. That? Because I think well, a lot of people don't understand. What, what do you mean by clocking in and clocking out? Well, because because for me, yeah, gym, and lo- although I enjoy it, when you're yeah. actually, if you did it like once a week or twice a week, yeah, it probably is enjoyable. Yeah, for, but for me, it's a lifestyle which I incorporate into mm-hmm. my life, right? Mm-hmm. So like reading, you know how people think like this. Okay, so this is my work. I do my work. And then I do my um, reading right which is mm-hmm. actually social sp- stroke pleasure mm. right and gym mm-hmm. which is social stroke pleasure now I, mm-hmm. I i wrap all of that into work so because i prioritize it so it needs mm-hmm. to get done everybody's always going to do their work right but you might skip the gym or you mm-hmm. might skip the uh the other stuff right mm-hmm. like the reading but because i think it's so important i'm classifying that like uh as as work so you're clocking into work and you clock out of work, right? Mm-hmm. So that's why I put like hashtag clock in, clock out. Yeah. So I think, you know, it's probably sooner or later, a couple of days where I don't go, I'm going to get some messaging. Ah, you didn't go. And that's fine. Because that will make me go. Yeah. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. So I thought like, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. How do we it. know you're actually staying in the gym? Like, what if you go in? <laughs> like, and you just <laughs> take a picture, go a out, picture. have lunch. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Like, well, I've lunch. actually thought about it long, long. Actually, mm. theoretically, what you can do is take about seven photos in one go and then just post mm-hmm. them like, mm. like every other day. I guess you, you're wearing you don't the really G-Shock know. And it has a date. Yeah, it does have the date. Mm. Like, but it doesn't always, I don't always take my watch though. Mm. So today I, I've already done like 5K. Um, mm. I didn't, I don't like running with my watch on, Yeah. Like yeah. even though if it's a G-Shock. So I didn't take my watch, but I took the picture of the treadmill, but it doesn't really say anything. You're just going to have to take my word for it. Mm. <laughs> I thought I did it. I mean, um, mm. it's the same question Alex asked me. He goes, how do I know you read these books? <laughs> yeah. mm. So he said, what we're going to do every mm. Sunday. Yeah. Mm. What we're going to do is you're going to tell me about the book. And I was like, but some of the books you've read, <laughs> like, you already know what it's about. Like, he was like exactly. That's oh, yeah. the point. He can test that you actually read it. Yeah, but some of the books he hasn't read, then he can't test. It's actually irrelevant. You just have to trust me. I've done it, right? Mm. And um, I said to I've him, concluded that Alex has trust issues. <laughs> I said to Alex, <laughs> like... if you manage to do it, what I will do is I will really push the boat out and buy you the Skyfall CD, so you can play <laughs> it in your car every day. <laughs> Yeah, even oh, you though should, his car. You should buy him like a uh, Skyfall vinyl. And uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And then... What I wanted to buy him was Skyfall something mm. that is totally irrelevant because you can't use it anymore, like a mm. vinyl or a CD. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> so he's got this thing that you can't use and useless. <laughs> right. But he so wants to listen to it. So I'll probably encompass the MP3 file or something with it. But uh, yeah, he, he quite politely told me to fuck off. Yeah. So, so yeah. <laughs> anyway, so how about you guys? That was quite a long part for me. But how about you guys? No, it was good. Jack, you, Jacqueline, you want to go? First? Um, yeah, so uh, I really want <clears throat> to start journaling, which was inspired by Lung, actually. So I bought myself a journal. Um, and what I've been doing is like, Yes, I've been like writing down what what was my day like, but also um, some quotes that I um, thought was that resonated with me while I'm doing like readings or listening to um, um, podcasts or watching videos. Um, and then I also want to improve my like flexibility by doing yoga. Um, I've never been a fan of yoga like ever. Um, but recently my, my, my friend, she's like a huge yoga person and she's always doing yoga at my house. So, um, I really want to start trying to do like beginner's yoga just from stretching first. Um, and then I don't have like that many new year resolutions because I want to like say a lot and don't stick with them. Um, another one is to get more like in contact with, um, like my, my grandparents, uh, because, I feel like sometimes when you're so far away from them and I don't really use WeChat on like a daily basis and I don't really talk to them a lot, 
um but sometimes you just like send voice memos but i actually want to start calling them once in a while um or like facetiming um and then maybe something more on my side i want to oh well dan i was telling you about this like i want to get more in touch with nature like uh watching more documentaries about the ocean about like climate change about um you know researching destinations that i want to like travel to and uh getting outside more i think um yeah it's this basically- all sounds uh really healthy yeah. Like, yeah. Does anyone have any unhealthy resolution? <laughs> like, no one's thinking, yeah. fuck man, my new resolution was yeah, to like eat fucking gam- shit tons of food. Like, and like now how I'm How do I get better at that? gambling? Yeah. <laughs> right. How about you then, Long? Um, well, you might not have it. I don't know. No, like every year, I will do it before the New Year's. I'll be very anal about this. I'll write it in the book <laughs> ones, I'll write it in my iPhone, everything. So last year, um, so I'll write it in a way that's like, I am writing this um, and I'm going to open this note one year later and I will be in a better place. Mm-hmm. I'll write all the stuff and I'll list everything out. And they're half, <clears throat> actually the three quarters quantitative and then one or two are more um, just descriptions, right? Mm-hmm. So for example, you could be like, I want to read 12 books so you can count the stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the biggest shift and, and the amazing thing is I open this every month. And I actually go, okay, I'm this percentage through. And in June of last year, I had actually hit everything already. Mm. Mm. So then I connected with some people on Instagram who were like actually motivational speakers. Mm. And I was like, fuck it, I'm just going to message them. They're probably never going to reply. But I watched their stuff on YouTube and I messaged them and then they replied. And Mm. I said, "Um, like, what am I doing wrong? Like, is it because the goals I'm setting are too low or um, like what's a good, uh, say a good figure, say books wise, right? Like what's that target number I need to be putting down? Like how scared do I have to be about failing or whatever? So I asked all these questions and they said, um, the f- like I'm not setting goals which are high enough. So you actually have to feel a bit of fear. Mm-hmm. Like it has to be a little bit unattainable. So this year I basically in my mind, the first thing I did was I calculated, instead of thinking, how much do I want to save this year? How much do I want to invest or whatever, right? The first thing I did was, I actually went the other way. I was like, I need to make X amount divided Mm. by 12, which means I need to hit X amount per month. And it was a figure that was way more than I was comfortable with. I was like, Mm. fuck it, just put it down. And then every month, look at how much you're closer to that. Mm. Um, so then I put, I started putting very specific figures, very specific dates. Um, so you basically have to be accountable because every time you open that, that note, which I do like all the time, right. Um, I will, it, it kind of like makes you go shit. It, it, like you got to keep going. And then mm-hmm. the other thing I do is that, you know, on your iPhone, like under notes, every time you write something new, that note gets pushed up to the top again. So Mm -hmm. that is using that same note. That's where I list every book I read. So Mm -hmm. even if you don't want to open that note, because you're like, fuck, this is a super long list of things I'm still behind on. You're forced to open that note to add that book. (laughs) So then when you're adding that book, you have no choice but to read the things that you haven't finished or you haven't completed. And then it makes you just keep going. So that's Mm -hmm. my thing this year, which is uh, I started getting very quantitative. Mm. And then I took out a few things, which I thought I was being a bit harsh on like myself with, Mm. there was a lot of like last year, there was a lot of, um, you have to balance, you have to, um, like, I, I would be like, you have to meditate, you have to journal, you have to this, you have to that and everything. And then that list just got really, really long. And then I realized this year, one, so Dan knows this, I was getting super burnt out, like towards the end of the year. And I think this year, I'm just going to be more kind to myself. Like, I am just wired to be like, I have to keep going, go, 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 go. I don't really believe in balance. So this year is just whatever makes me feel good, like I'll do it. If it means that I don't want to fucking do yoga, because I also tried yoga. But even when I was doing yoga, I was like, I need to be running on the treadmill kind of feeling. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to go with that. I'm going to go with whatever makes me feel good. If I want to take a nap, I'm going to take a nap. If I want to be 
if I need to just work and it's super late, I'll just keep going. I'm not going to be like, oh, no, you got to be healthy. You got to be balanced. Like, I'm not going to do that anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So listening more so to yeah. yourself instead of like yeah. what you down earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's my thing. How about you, Jack? What about you, Jack? After you all of us make- went through this whole... <laughs> yeah <laughs> you guys are making me feel bad because i didn't make any new year resolutions i'm so not surprised with that answer because uh yeah i just know, Actually, I I know you so well. new year resolution happens after the chinese new year <laughs> fair enough fair enough <laughs> all right okay okay so no, oh, new, no oh, new year resolutions from you yeah we'll, we'll check in yeah we'll check in with him yeah we have to make <laughs> him accountable still won't make any. <laughs> After does, Chinese New Year, we, we can't find him anymore. <laughs> does, does, uh, yeah, he's unaccountable. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> what what watches does everybody want to get this year? Does anybody have anything like that? Oh man. Anyway, I'm getting sick and tired now. I kind of really want my double balance. So, like, <laughs> Kevin, if you can hear this, yeah, you know, that's exactly how I'm feeling right now. Uh, I, I've refrained from spamming you. But um, yeah, I don't know how long that will be. So, and then I've got quite a lot of friends as well. So after I've finished spamming you, I might ask some of my friends to spam you. So let's all start off the year in a good way, positive way, and at least give, give me something. Me what I want. Just give yeah, me. Yeah, either give me what I want or give me something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Jack? Jacqueline? Oh, please don't ask me. The thing is, you're you're constantly anyway. I think it's irrelevant, yeah. man. You're just like yeah. on a constant conveyor belt of watches and like totally awesome watches. I think if anything, it should be like how many pieces <laughs> should I limit myself to this year? <laughs> well, I mean, you guys know the one I'm trying to work on. So um, that's like the one that's on my, <clears throat> that's like my pr- priority right now. But it's, I don't know. Well, I, I hope I hope by that time, yeah, by the time it's all sorted, this whole thing is lifted and then somehow we can do something which is like offline and mm-hmm. uh, just mark that day. That would be that would be pretty awesome. Yeah, that would be very yeah. meaningful to me. Yeah. How about hopefully, you? Lung? Hopefully it will be be- before 2022, by the way. I know. Yeah. <laughs> me. Yeah. Uh, it's it's difficult. Like you guys know Well, Jacqueline knows this, like my password. For, I always change my password for my internet banking to that watch, my next watch. And now it's getting really confusing. I have so many passwords, <laughs> different <laughs> logins. It's like, this one's Cartier, that yeah. one's a long age. Like, it's yeah. so confusing. So I know I haven't found that watch that's making me go, okay, all the passwords mm. need to be the same. Uh, so mm. I'm working on that. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Well, I think I, I think I know one of yeah. your passwords. Well, I, I think I might. Yeah. Know. The, yeah. She's like one day. She's like, hey, is your password like Kari? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jack, how about you? Yeah. I want a Kari Observatoire. Hmm. Or a logical one from Roman Gautier. Mm. Okay. But see just, how it uh, goes, I guess. Just hold on on that because, uh, yeah, that's a question actually later on. But anyway, that does fit in nicely because we actually have to get back to you because this is this podcast is yeah. about <laughs> is about you and. Uh, <laughs> but it doesn't have to be. No, the thing I, is. Why the fuck am I here? Honestly. Well, <laughs> like... <laughs> you guys, you really don't know what a privilege this really is because Jack is usually not up at this hour. He's usually still oh. sleeping. Yeah. So I swear, <laughs> the day before yesterday, like you got up yeah. like at three p.m. because. Because you left a message in one of our, our WeChat groups, right? That, that we work on, you know, a work WeChat group. And you said, yeah, well, gong qi lai. And it was like three uh, past no, three o'clock. Like, I was like, that was like one, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> okay, one, one. Okay, one p.m. Okay, sorry. Sorry. Not, not three p.m., one p.m. Right. And um, quite literally, if Jack was an animal, I think he would be a sloth. A sloth. Right? I was just thinking that. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, I think he would be a sloth. But uh, I was writing this interview for Jack this week and I called him twice and no lie, this is no joke. I couldn't find anything fucking interesting about him <laughs> to set up any questions about him. Right? And we were actually laughing, thinking we should cancel this interview because basically it's such a struggle. You know, he's totally not motivated. He doesn't really give a shit. You know, he, he's like sleeping. He's not into anything. We kind of like 
like broadcast on this podcast you know <laughs> so i was like what the hell do i talk about which is why i spent half of this podcast filling in with us <laughs> 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 but uh but his watch collecting is kind of interesting and i guess when we talk about collecting collectors yeah. you know that's the kind of part we actually care about so that part he's a little bit different from the norm but for the sake of the audience Jack and Jacqueline and London because they they know you but not so well not like me um can you give us like a little background of like where you're from how old you are where you grew up educated upbringing sexual orientation or anything like that <laughs> you know just to give just some to listeners some <laughs> Why are you trying to make this interesting? Like, <laughs> I am. I'm really scratching the barrel. I really are. <laughs> yeah, just to give the listeners some context, Jack. You don't have to give us your sexual orientation, but that was a joke. But yeah, just give us the listeners some context. So I was born in Shanghai uh, in 1993, which makes me like 28 this year. And I moved to Vancouver when I was in elementary school and then I moved back to finish my elementary school in China and then I officially moved over their grade eight to start secondary school there and then I did university there and worked for like three years there and moved back to China. Where did you go to elementary like w- w- what are the schools that you went to in, in Vancouver? Uh, I went to Stony Creek Okay. elementary school for like a year and then my mom was like they're not actually teaching you anything you're just playing every day yeah, yeah. <laughs> so she forced me to move back yeah and then when I finished like elementary school in China she was like do you actually want to go to Vancouver I was like yeah give it a shot so mm-hmm. I just moved there grade eight I actually skipped mm-hmm. a year because technically I left grade six here and then I didn't do grade seven and start grade eight mm. in Vancouver mm. and I went to a Burnaby Mountain secondary school oh yeah 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 and then I went to UBC after that so I've just been staying in Vancouver for like a dozen of years yeah yeah, yeah. right so so you said you're Shanghainese and yeah. a lot of people a lot of, actually even on this podcast we, we always talk about like China you know as a just as a whole mm. but how would you say shanghainese the culture in shanghai shanghai differs from let's say beijingers hong kongers and other parts of china what are the typical shanghainese stereotypes and do you think it's true it's obviously very early for you <laughs> yeah no I just, i'm just thinking what are the stereotypes for like, one stereotypes second that you can think of for one second, I was like, is there something wrong with the internet? <laughs> I was thinking, like, what kind of stereotype are you talking about? Uh, okay, for example, well, I like, I'm not, like, Shanghainese girls. Oh, okay, what's the stereotype of Shanghainese girls then? Shanghainese Let me hear girls, that one. Yeah. <laughs> I thought Lala was going to say what the stereotype is. I was waiting for her to say it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jack, do you know the stereotype for Shanghainese girls? Not really. What is it? Hold on, don't okay. like that they like foreigners don't choke on your food. or something like that. Um, <laughs> no. Uh, well, okay. From my understanding, is like Shanghai yeah. is famous for having like narinbiyashiyanarie, like, and then the women tend to be more kind of like powerful in the family. So they have more like a hua yu quan. So they more have like say an authority in the family. And the man kind of uh, respects, well, respects it would be the nicer way. If you talk to a, like a, a northerner, they probably say they kind of cower to the woman. But that kind of relationship. Plus Shanghainese, another stereotype I think is that Shanghainese are quite famous for being xiao qi. So very calculating, um, not that generous. Um, I'm not saying that's my experience. I'm just saying, I think just from hearsay and what my feeling is when I talk to other people, that's what they think Shanghai. I remember before I came to Shanghai, uh, like a mentor of mine said to me, Shanghainese will split a cent with you. They're mm-hmm. that 
Mm. they're that calculating you know that that like non-generous mm. so that's the kind of stereotype that i've heard i've kind of answered well, the now question. that you've been in shanghai for a long time do you feel like that that's how it is no no because because like when it becomes when you're talking about being xiaoqi or non-generous right you don't get much more than that in the west <laughs> you know what i mean and that's where i like totally brought up in right so and then i'm also have uh, my origins in hong kong so I feel that if that is the case, um, Shanghai and Hong Kong are the first two places which uh, kind of touch the West, like in, in right. terms of like Chinese culture. So there is an element of how Western culture has infiltrated that local culture. Mm. And uh, maybe that is the misinterpretation of, uh, you know, being not so generous. Because I, if you talk to... Like, yes, clearly, if you go to northern parts of China, right, you think, wow, like, so generous. But then I, I always feel like I'm so indebted to them all the time. Or I feel a bit uncomfortable. Or, like, is there something you're after? I mean, that's just how my brain is kind of wired. Mm. So I do think when I go into places like Shanghai and Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong's a bit too realistic for me. But Shanghai is actually a really good medium for me because you do literally have, how I see it, uh, East meets West. You, I still feel I'm, certainly all the Shanghainese people. There's no way I would be where I am in Shanghai if it wasn't for Shanghainese people. Like, and you're one of those people that, well, admittedly, you haven't helped me a lot. But like, <laughs> uh, I still think you know you always give me your time. Um, you're very pleasant. You know, if if you could help me in your capacity, you would. Uh, and I find that with a lot of Shanghainese, I think and it's kind of like a misunderstood um in the fact that i think they're very respectful and they don't like promising things they can't do right so that goes across instead of like being non general because if you go to like northern parts of china they say a lot of stuff and you think can you actually do it mm -hmm. <laughs> like and, and yeah. then you, they probably can't do it and then you think well what can you do and what can't you do i'm kind of like not very clear right but in shanghai it's very clear because they don't want to do something and promise you that they can't do. That's my that's my understanding anyway. I don't know about you, Jack. You're, you're well, to get back to you on the how you feel like women has more power in China, right? I feel like I saw an interesting uh, perspective. It's because China, uh, like Shanghai, is the first country that's to meet the West. So all the work <laughs> in Shanghai is actually not labor work. Like it's more like textile or like 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 uh, precision engineering that kind of stuff so women can actually work and make a decent living unlike other most other regions in china at the time where most of the work is still manual labor so a lot of the work only men can do so women has to stay home and support their family or whatnot so they don't have a living which they don't have much say in the household right because in shanghai women can make even more money than men um, in some cases Mm. women have a lot more say than men sometimes right compared to other regions in china ah oh, that was a very good explanation mm. like yeah i like that i mean when i also heard something as well was the way that shanghai's feng shui the feng shui of shanghai included huangpujiang the way it curves around the the shanghai is totally the feng shui benefits women more have you heard of that oh Okay. All but right, moving on. I'm not into the feng shui stuff, <laughs> unlike your mom is. Yeah, moving on. So how did you get into watches? So I actually always thought watches was a bit ostentatious, and I wasn't really interested in it. I thought it was more for people to drunk be. Mm. Okay. But I, I was watching a bit. I just stumbled upon some videos on YouTube talking about minute repeaters and the uh, uh, longer data graph. And I was really, really impressed by the craftsmanship and the, the finishing of these movements. And I was like, wow, there's really something aside from just showing off how much money you have. There's like, it's like art. So I started really digging into these mechanical watches and stuff. So I, I started looking at a lot of independents because it's a lot more interesting because they, they, they either do something that's really special 
or is their movement finish just out of the world? Right, because unlike the big brands that have a lot of advertisement, the independents actually have to do something special to sell their watch. Yeah, so that that's what got me really interested in watches. Mm. So, like when you start looking at watches, and you said like, oh, you know, the movement finishing was great. How did you have an appreciation of movement finishing? When I first started, I didn't know much about movement finishing. It just looks really stunning. Like if you look at the datograph movement, it looks like a small city, right? So it just looked really good. And then I started looking into it, like what is actually a good movement finishing? Like what actually makes it good? Okay. Because yeah. one thing, you're like one of a handful of people in my like friend circle that's actually into art. And I don't mean you stand there pretending like you know something like because you regularly go to art galleries and stuff like by yourself like literally and appreciate and appreciate the art like how did you get into art because i think that's kind of like yeah maybe a, a foundation maybe of your appreciation for watchmaking i guess i, I just already, always like the stories behind objects and also like aesthetically good looking stuff mm. From a very young age, I've been like my grandparents take me to the antique stores in around Shanghai. Mm. Uh, I've been looking at like porcelains and like Chinese paintings and whatnot. And then when I moved over to Canada, I started looking at like Western paintings and the uh, modern and contemporary art and stuff. Mm. Yeah, so I've been always pretty interested in that. But unlike watches, art is. Uh, pretty unaffordable these days <laughs> so yeah i remember i remember the, uh so i didn't know like obviously i don't know jack that well we've only talked over instagram but i remember you posting a photo of um this modern piece with the lights and i saw it and i really really liked it um yes. I, forget, I forget the artist's name you told me but I, I don't remember from the top of my head but it's um it's it's absolutely stunning it's it's amazing how like simple the com like unlike watches you know it, it, with so many components modern art it's like you don't even need components like you just need maybe like a wall and a light and that's it but it's so i don't i don't want to say stunning it's just so eye pleasing and it makes you feel comfortable to look at and i and i love stuff like that yeah yeah admittedly i'm not yeah sorry go ahead no i was just saying we talk about watches being a lonely journey do you think art's even like lonelier or is there more of an appreciation of art because i don't know man a lot of people like probably art's more uh like probably like in terms of the market yeah people generally can appreciate art but really can they can they because i don't think many people know what they're talking about you know do you think it's a more of a lonely why do you thing? think watches is a lonely journey because uh, I don't think that, you know, there's many people that are actually into watches, especially at the level that you are into art and watches and how I'm into watches. It's only through, I mean, it's part of the reason why Shanghai Watch Gang exists, right? Because it was actually pretty hard. And then, um, yeah, this kind of platform made it easier to, to, to kind of find other people with similar level of interest in this kind of thing. Um, even before I did that, the whole research of watching, uh, of watches like you, was done by yourself. It wasn't done like in a group or anything like that. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about lonely. I feel like there's quite a bit of art collectors out there, but. Okay. Like. In ter even in terms of watches, right? I think it's the community that makes it interesting. Like you talk about it and then you find out stuff that's not really on the internet. Because if you just sit there and just search a certain watch, you only get so far, right? And then there are some backstories you might never find out because they don't publish it online or the people who do know do not go on the internet or they, they don't want it to stay on the internet. Mm. Yeah. 
But you're, you're kind of knowledge on watches. There's so many, so much stuff that, okay, I have an appreciation for and you have an appreciation for. But then when I talk to you about it, you seem to like know a little bit more than me, like maybe a 20% to 50% more. Like, wow, <laughs> I didn't know that. Is it because I'm not going past Google's first page <laughs> that I'm not, you know, where are you getting the information from? Uh, sometimes like I see a post on Instagram and I just ask the owner about it because usually people who own the watches, they know a lot more mm -hmm. than just what the Google says, right? So how do you evaluate a good watch in your opinion or, a part, you know, what interests you in the watch, watch world now? Well, to me, first and foremost is the movement finishing and probably the movement design comes after that. And then it's the whole package, like the case, the dial, the, the hands. So like it needs to be a pretty good package for me to want to buy it. So would you put movement ahead of the dial? Yes, for me it is. Oh, okay. Interesting. So you never really kind of got through the standard like Rolex, Patek. I think you went straight to the FBJ. So does branding have any impact on you? Do you care about it? Uh, I guess I do in a way. Like, I, I wouldn't buy a watch because it's a certain brand, but I would not buy a watch because it's a certain brand. <laughs> okay, so give an example. Like, uh, like Hublot, Frank Mueller. Like, you if, can say that. so it was the finishing, <laughs> yeah. So, it was the finishing of a Hublot, not the dial, just the finishing of the movement is good. He'll buy it. Like, I think yeah, Hublot Frank, is actually yeah. quite good value at times because I feel like their their sapphire watches, like compared mm -hmm. to Richard Mille, mm -hmm. is actually pretty good value. Mm -hmm. Not that I would mm -hmm. buy it, but I feel like they are doing something. Oh, one example is uh, Mont Blanc. Not mm -hmm. to shit on Mont Blanc. I love their pens. They're an excellent pen company. Mm -hmm. But they released the mono pusher with the Minerva movement that looks amazing. But because the dial says Mont Blanc, and I don't really like, like their logo either, like with the mountain stuff, like it looks kind of weird. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I couldn't put my hands on that watch. But the movement does look very good, the, the mono pusher. Right. So, but, so if, if, yeah. if it didn't say Mont Blanc, you probably would have bought it. Maybe at a good discount. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so if it said like Daniel Wellington, <laughs> <laughs> you're like, all right. <laughs> right. I guess like watches though. Or if this like... said Minerva, that would be fine. Like I don't know why they had to make it like or even if they made their logo look better or something <laughs> well how do you feel about that because like Mont Blanc and um you know they do use maneuver movements but I think uh you know Bulgari had it with Daniel Roth for a time being where you have like two brands do you think that's confusing or you know what would you have done in those situations I'm sure they have their good reason to, to incorporate Minerva into Mont Blanc because maybe like opening all these new stores and the supply chain is just too much a hassle, even if they wanted to re revive the Minerva brand, right? Mm. So just incorporate it into Mont Blanc to do it. But like, right. and if you look at how Bulgari overtook Gerald Genta and Daniel Roth, mm. uh, it didn't end very well. Like both of the brands no longer exist. They make like one or two off watches for a celebration, but you could you wouldn't walk in the Bulgari store and see a Daniel Roth or like a Gerald Genta on the shelf anymore, right? Of course not, so. yeah. Hmm. So watches have primarily been like tools as well, like like Rolex, you know, they're really in that kind of vein. So I guess none of that side of the watches interests you because you come from a more of an art side. Is that true? Yeah, like the durability of the watch is not very interesting to me. Okay. Like it is interesting to hear the story of how Rolex made it like they can go X number of meters down the ocean with the helium escape valve and whatnot. But it's not like I can get a Rolex anyway, so 
<laughs> oh. <laughs> right. I know you have a list of watches that you keep, kind of like your hit list. I think maybe everybody has one here. Um, do you mind sharing what's actually on there? Because I think it's quite fluid. Because yesterday uh, you mentioned yeah. this Cartier. I never knew you had a Cartier on that list. And then you said, yeah, yeah, there's this Cartier that I'm really interested in. And you showed it to me. I was like, yeah, totally not my thing. But uh, what's on that? Is that it's what's on your hit on list? list? But that was just the only Cartier I kind of wanted. It's a tar Cartier Tenka Quichette. It's a jump hour Cartier. Okay. Which so what's on your metal, list? Which metal? Uh, platinum. I saw one in platinum in China. Yeah. Yeah. The the tank issue is a really funny story. Um. So like, Dan, are you are you not familiar with the with the model? I am a familiar with the model. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah. 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 I'm not seeing it in flesh, but I've, I know what the piece is. Yeah. Yeah. So um. So like, they were so obviously it's one of the discontinued models of the brand. But then actually, um, I heard it from somewhere that they were trying to rev revive it um, for the like the during the CPCP era. Um, and then it would just like it just continue. It just is not, does not exist anymore. So that on the second market now, um, funny story, like I, I saw one on eBay. This was November or December of 2019. And I actually saw it when I was in Vancouver and it was on eBay. And then it sold for like 12000 And when I saw that, I was like, oh my God. So I messaged the guy immediately. I was like, okay, like, because there was one bid on it. And I was like, oh, was it sold? Is it not sold? He never got back to me. And then like, three or four days later this um reseller from uh, uh uh amsterdam listed it and then the listing price was like 60k so i was like oh my god like this whoever bought it got such a such a steal because it's impossible to find those watches now um yeah yeah but i like the platinum one is so cool but if, if i could find one like i love the original version or in the pre like in the 30s or 40s those things are just they're like yeah so the original version yeah. has the crown at 12 o'clock yes but the later version has it at uh three o'clock yeah so cool they actually made a limited of three pieces with the crown at 12 o'clock i think was the vintage movement in like 1997 when they released the 150 piece limited edition as well but it's only like three pieces so i'll probably never see it in my lifetime yeah a part of the 150th anniversary yeah so what's on your list oh okay so ap double balance <laughs> uh kari observatoire uh roman gautier logical one Mm. Uh, Rekshep, Rekshepis, Chronomet Contemporain, mm. oh, okay. uh, Bayat Haldeman H2, <clears throat> which is a flying tourbillon resonance, and uh, Longa Datograph. Wow, okay. And there's also like some odd ones that say like, do force duality simplicity that's okay, probably yeah, not very attainable. <laughs> <laughs> and like a drawing resonance yeah <laughs> probably not that attainable now either yeah yeah had my chance didn't take it <laughs> yeah <laughs> right wow. you've got like some admiration for langer um that's how you kind of got into watches um yes. what do you think langer could do to improve their like branding and penetration within watch collectors although branding is not important to you. How do you think they could improve? Uh, I don't think they need to. I don't, I don't think, think they, they need, need to improve their branding in among watch collectors. They just need to market it to more average audience who's not, who's not browsing Instagram about watches, who's not reading articles about watches. Because I feel like all the watch collectors have enough respect for Lange as a brand. Mm. But a lot of people who's not very into watches, they don't know Lange as any, like, at all so the, i feel like their secondary price is not that high because there just isn't enough demand 
because it's only the watch community that's trying to buy the longer watches. Mm. And if they can't educate the mass audience on like why this movement is much better than like a under watch that you can buy for the same price, then maybe they will take off as mm. a brand. So but how yeah, would you guess, how how would you do that though to the mass audience? So you basically pushed well, it I on. Knew, I would have been working at Longy right now. Well, maybe you wouldn't. <laughs> like because what you you didn't know much about watches and you saw that movement and you were like, wow, you know what I mean? Like yeah. So it's not like you were a watch connoisseur when you saw that. Yeah, but I guess not everyone appreciates it, right? Some people might see it and they're like, okay, it looks pretty good. But of all the people I showed the like a longer movement to, nobody said it looks bad or like it's not interesting or anything. I guess maybe they can find more like social media presence, KOL to like showcase their watches or whatnot. Like but at the same time, I feel like a lot of Swiss brands or German brands in this case, they don't want to do it because they feel like advertising finding KOL like lowers their brand value or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. One watch I want to address is the Cartier Monopusher. I think you guys knew this was coming. Yeah. Which I'm happy to talk about today because like Long Long and Jacqueline, they they both have that piece in a yeah. different um configuration. But uh maybe for all the listeners out there, I don't know, maybe you can just maybe Long Long can explain exactly what that piece looks like. And then how Jack can I say, that? how did you come across CPCP? Wait, so should I start with, well, how did I come across it? No, how did you, like, what does it look like? Just describe it. What does it, it look so that... like? What's the way to explain it? So I would say, um, just from the top of my head, if I were to describe this to someone, I would say like, like, you know, the Elegante case from FP. Mm -hmm. That's how I would describe the case. So I'll be Tornet, like, that's Tornet the shape. case. Yeah. But um, what's the main thing that jumps out to me? Well, for mine, I would say that the mark is a blue. That's the th first few things I'll think about. Mm -hmm. Case is interesting. Mm -hmm. Mark is a blue. Uh, case is actually really thin, easy to wear. And two subdials in the center. Yeah. Yeah. A, a little bit off center, but pretty much center and I would say I'm trying to think of the bigger stuff because if you if you want to zoom in and you start going on about the dial and the and trying to explain that flower motif I think people get lost so those are the main things I would first say I wouldn't even go on about like how the monopusha works mm. yeah yeah so yeah, I would yeah, just explain it like that yeah so yeah. how do you like find dial, out about yeah. it so I met a collector and yeah, Dan finds it really funny. So this is like, we, we can never name this guy on, on this channel, right? But um, he's by far the weirdest um, collector I have ever met. Like, I don't think I'll ever meet someone this weird in my weird lifetime. Is this the one with the weird? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. The one with the what? Yeah. Weird shoes. Okay. Dan, where did you go? Is he laughing on the bed? Laugh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, I usually only meet collectors when I know they have a piece I will never get to see or touch. So I, I will say I need to see this piece. And this mm -hmm. person was like, okay, I'll bring something I don't think you would like, but um, you probably won't get to see this. And he had just picked it up. So when I first saw it, when he took it out, I was like, fuck he brought a Cartier mm. and I was like so disappointed in my head because I wanted to see all the FPs mm. um but then I looked at it he explained it and I went back and I started reading about it but initially all the articles that popped up were written by Arthur the first one I read was Arthur Touche he wrote one for Phillips mm. and oh. I actually subsequently went back and reread that like three times just to make sure I didn't miss anything um, there must be more to it because I, I couldn't find production number and I was like no way like how come I, I looked at the forums and everything and I was like how can people not be able to say production numbers when mm -hmm. it's not even that special it's like you can still find this watch if you really look for it you mm -hmm. know um, 
so I just started reading and then I started messaging people. Yeah, a lot of it was messaging people on Instagram. So that's how I learned about it. Yeah. Why did you just what ask about you guys? Yeah. for that information? Because you know what's funny is I did. So I went to, I went to, well, I didn't email them. I went to the store anyways, because I was like, I need to add a hole, punch a hole into my strap before mm-hmm. my new strap arrives. And literally they looked at it and I know that they have been trained, like retrained recently to know about the crash. But Mm -hmm. I think for them to remember all the different models, it's impossible, right? So I said to them, hey, um, can you help me punch a hole? So the first reaction was, is this a Cartier watch? And I was like, yes, it is, right? (laughs) And then the first person said, sure, it's free. It's easy for us. But I also think, because I was wearing the love bracelet, right? They were probably like, okay, whatever. Because I can just say, I need to clean my bracelets anyways. Mm. So they took it back to the back, right? And then they come back and they said, but you didn't buy this at the store. And then I said, of course not. There's no way you can buy this at the store. Yeah. <laughs> and then they said, but it's not the crash. And I, and then they said, and I, and then I said, It sounds oh, such a dumb you know, conversation. I know. Yeah. And I was like, wow, you know about the crash, huh? And then she showed me her phone, which had the training manual thing. And then you could see from their training manual, which was like crash, create a white year, whatever. And they basically recognized, uh, like they had to memorize a few big models that were vintage. So if somebody came in with a crash, they would be like, oh, you know, potential customer kind of thing. But because the mono pusher wasn't part of that, like four or five, they had to remember, they, were ba- they gave it back to me and they said, we can't uh, punch the hole for you. What? I was shocked. What? Yeah, I was so shocked. After you already took my watch, brought it to the back, probably disgusted, right? Like, like how should we hard punch is, the hole? How hard is that? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, and I, so I was really shocked. And then, um, so I tried and I said, <clears throat> the reason why you can't find this watch in the store is because it's old. So I was like trying to explain <laughs> this to them. And then after a while, I was like, they, don't, they just don't get it. <laughs> like it's they don't funny, get it it's funny how like if you you said that they went through new training so if someone were to bring in like mm. a 1967 crash they would be more than happy to well you don't really yeah have holes for the crash because they can recognize yeah they can yeah. recognize the shape that's in, yeah that's wow. uh, i think so i yeah. think they shouldn't really show you the training manual because that just absolutely exactly. blows away the mystique like if you don't know <laughs> exactly. the watch you have to have a get out way of not knowing the watch and and servicing the client yeah. to show you the service manual and we're only trained in this i just like it's not really classy and it's just not very yeah. nice it's, i heard okay. from a friend in singapore that cartier is actually starting to sell vintage pieces yeah. of their own brand yes yes yeah no they've, um, always, start, sold, the, they've always sold vintage yeah pieces. oh okay I didn't people know. clocks uh clocks uh vintage pocket watches um mm. Yeah, but I, I first found out in Boston when I went into the boutique and they actually showed me their um, database, but the pieces they were asking for way too much. Yeah, like remember, it's so high. Uh, okay. yeah, yeah. I remember there was a medium size Centre from the 40s. It was a really beautiful example, but they were asking for like 160K. And I was just like, what? Mm. <laughs> what? what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and then his, their, his reasoning was, well, you can buy a lot of vintage Cartiers on the market, but this one is actually like comes from the Maison, and then we Cartier. actually like a- a- like authenticate it, and it comes with documents and paperwork, and I'm like, okay, okay, cool, cool, one hundred sixty, I'm sure. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think aside from um, them already selling it and people asking for it, they're trying to do this tour thing now. So it started in Hong Kong, December. Well, I left already. So they, there's a there's like twenty to thirty watches, right? Yeah. And it's now go, moving through Asia. So it's now in Singapore. I'm gonna go look at it. But um, again, I saw the training manual with the notes on the thing and what they're selling, and I was like, this price is stupid. It's yeah. so high. Yeah. I mean, yeah. did you see anything good though? I haven't gone yet, but I'm going to go to, um, you talk to the person on Instagram as well. Like Ooh. J-U-L, J-U-L-S-G something. Oh, oh Julian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, oh, so I, get, I, I didn't know that. that. I didn't yeah. know that they were doing the, the tour thing. But then it's yeah. that they're doing it because they're doing like the same thing with Vacheron because Vacheron has. Yeah, I was thinking that. 
uh, department yeah. where they kind of like yeah. buy in vintage pieces and then they um, put it in a collection and they will like do um, collaborations with different um, I guess like boutiques or, or stores mm-hmm. they did one with the armory um, yeah I thought that was that was pretty cool like they're finally introducing yeah. vintage pieces to to more consumers yeah yeah I think it's also because they they recognize like the modern ones which are inspired by the vintage just isn't the same like people would just be like can I get the vintage one please (laughs) also I think they're okay they've been doing in my opinion way too many like homage pieces like Mm. it's the 100th um, anniversary for the century right they just did a like 150 or 100 piece um, Mm. modern century that looks exactly like the one Mm. um, 100 years ago and uh, like I don't know like to me yeah it was it was so cool but like they kept it as a secret like they they never Mm. announced it so I thought that was like if you're celebrating 100 years of, of a history like shouldn't you be advertising about it um mm-hmm. yeah but maybe they thought yeah it's cool to like keep it under the radar and for people who how many yeah. pieces did they make 150 I think like 100 or 150 i can't remember but it's it literally it looks exactly like the one in um 19 like 11 i think some brands they don't advertise it because they don't have the stock because they don't want exactly, to advertise it. And people go that. to them yeah. and they're like, oh, we don't have this anymore. And it pisses other yeah. people off because they just sell it to their VIPs and it's gone. And, and what's really cool yeah. about that piece, um, and I saw it before like, it actually came out, um, and I actually brought it up with someone. Like In the initial drawing, they had uh, Swiss made under the six o'clock. And I'm like, oh gosh, like that's kind of, it, it puts mm-hmm. me off. And then the actual one came out without Swiss made. And that was a surprise for me because when I saw it, I was like, oh, like, because they all have Swiss made now, like before they had, you know, London or Paris, but this one came without Swiss made. So it's like exactly identical to the 1921 one. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. Mm. So were you able to get one? No, it's way too big for me. The Centre literally wears, I mean, I've never tried it, but I've seen it on, um, like I've asked people to try it on and for me to see. And even for like on a man's wrist, it looks like you're wearing like one of those Star Wars props. Like the ones that like, literally <laughs> light has something levitating. If I were to wear it, it would literally just look like a bangle. Um, and mm-hmm. I, yeah, so I, I would, I mean, I understand and I appreciate the history. I just can't get something. And then like, it's just, gonna look ridiculous on me um that's why i'm trying to like if i could i'll find a small or medium centray i can never wear the large centray i don't think mm. yeah i think uh it- i think it's uh hard to talk about cartier without talking about cpcp which i know we are very kind of almost well versed in cpcp but i'm sure a lot of listeners don't know cpc certainly i know uh jack didn't know until last year and i don't think long long did until the year before or something mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so i think let's talk about cpcp jack what is cpcp yeah so i didn't know about anything about cpcp until i met this collector from taiwan called a bialist on instagram and mm-hmm. then he was wearing a cpcp centre. And then he was showing me and he's like, oh, this is the Cartier CPCP. And I was like, what's the CPCP? And then Daniel was like, you didn't know what the CPCP is? Mm. <laughs> I was like, oh, I better look into that. I was trying to like, be nice. Like, I, was I, was it, you, I was shocked. I was shocked. I was shocked. I was shocked. I bet you didn't know much about CPCP at the time anyways. Well, you? actually, I came across CPCP uh, at Watchfinder, right? So I was looking at a lot of pieces on the secondary market. And I was just Cartier pieces. I was just, it was actually during my formative years of understanding watch collecting. And uh, so I saw these other Cartiers. I think there was like one at a time where it was under a different section called Collection Privé. And I was like, okay, I'll have a look at those because I was just looking at everything and just trying mm-hmm. to, I guess I was learning and kind of enjoying myself. But um, I thought, wow, this looks so much better than mm. the modern pieces. So already then I knew about um, there was something different. So then I was like, okay, well, why does it look so much better? So then I started looking at the dial, right? And it, I wasn't really familiar with the term of like guilloche, but 
obviously you could you know you don't need to understand the term the guillotine to understand um, you know that dial's flat and this is, has some texture on it right mm. and i was right. like whoa that makes a huge difference to the watch mm. yeah and then that was really my understanding of cpcp -CP. i didn't actually know actually it was called cpcp -CP until again i met another collector and then he told me CPCP. And then I realized what I had seen before was mm. CPCP, which is, I think it's Cartier Paris Collection Privé, mm. right? Mm. And then again, kind of like my effect on Jack, I started reading about it. And then I recognized about, oh, well, I understood about the rose and the, the rose we're kind of talking about is this mm. kind of pattern, which likes like a flower leaf pattern. Mm. It's funny, actually, that you like that, Jacqueline, because you're kind of leaf person. But <laughs> it goes around the middle of the watch where the hands are. And yeah. then you can really tell, and then the, 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 the watches generally have a different kind of gearless depending on the model. Yeah. Um, and then you realized it was a kind of a, a Cartier on steroids that mm. um, they produced. Uh, when I say that, I don't mean they just spent time on the dial. The movements looked different. Yes. Uh, they looked to probably the untrained eye like they were a lot, lot higher quality. But, mm -hmm. you know, when you're talking about the independence, yeah, it's not there. Yeah. Um, but certainly above standard pieces where I do believe, you know, some of those pieces that are modern not too long ago were still using spacer rings for their movements in Cartier yeah. Well, tanks also and stuff. when the CPCP was released in late 1990s, like they were already using quartz movements, right, for some of the models. And for them to introduce a series of, I can't remember the number of models, um, it was like five or six, um, and reintroduce them. I, because here's, here's my understanding of the CPCP. So I learned about CPCP from a, a, follow, a fellow Shanghai person. Um, he collects a lot of Omegas, uh, but, but he's also like a very... Uh, enthusiastic about Cartier so I learned it through him and he and because we were talking about Cartier and he's like oh yeah I only collect CPCP and I was like what is that and then so I started reading about it and actually the reasoning behind the CPCP line was Cartier started as like a jewelry house right it wasn't that big of a you know watchmaking deal until the early 1900s and for Cartier to put out watches, it wasn't about the movement because they collaborated with a lot of companies like AP or uh, Jaeger or Piaget, uh, to name a few. Uh, for them, it's mainly about the shapes. It's about the design, going back to their roots of, of the Maison. And when they introduced the CPCP, it was like paying tribute to the most... Um, uh, well accepted and and beloved uh, designs of the house which were you know the louis the centre the tortue the basculant basculant um and uh the uh, to know if i'm I, I might be missing a few um so then they introduced it but uh, paired it with like the utmost of, of craftsmanship so um you know going back to what jack was saying you know how he like um really pays attention to the movement and finishing um i don't know if you can see on every watch but i know for sure on the mono pusher the um and the tortu so like not not the mono pusher but like the regular tortu and also some of the tank louis you can see like a cutout you know long like the cutout you can actually see through the sapphire mm, back mm, mm. with the engraving yeah, yeah. And, the and the rubies yeah you can see that yeah these models i know for sure it's the mono pressure so about a part of the tortue line and also the mm -hmm. tank, uh, v and maybe the tank Lee. um but for the centre because the back is like curved or maybe they wanted to keep it utmost classic it's all enclosed backs but i'm sure if you were to open it you can see the signature like the cartier signed on the on the movement which in my mm -hmm. opinion is like really really cool i know it's certainly like one of the first details I've noticed when I started researching. Um, mm. But I'm glad that it's like getting more recognition now and, and, and more like, um, yeah, it's getting more like attention about it. I know um, that Cartier is trying to reintroduce some of their discontinued models 
this year or like next year so maybe yeah. it's like people are saying yeah bring back the cpcp but i don't think they're gonna do it or at least like anytime soon maybe they'll just reintroduce some models and pay tribute to the vintage sides slowly but i also like how they're trying to do similar things with um like similar to vacheron or similar to fp where they're like buying back pieces vintage pieces from collectors and then selling it to more people i really like that at a premium yeah, at a premium. i was just gonna say yeah <laughs> uh, at a huge premium yeah. yeah but uh i think that's a really good kind of backdrop of what cpcp is but going mm. back to the modern pusher we can address that in the fact that so apparently this model for sure movement like during the CPCP period, of, of course, Cartier doesn't have, I wouldn't say they don't have much wa watchmaking know-how, but they don't do like the complication stuff that well. So mm -hmm. they outsourced a lot of their movement to like Frederick Piguet, like Gerard Perigo, AP. Mm -hmm. And one of the companies they they outsourced this model pressure movement to was a, a THA, and which is a company that was formed by three huge names in the independent in the watchmaking scene right now. Mm. Vianney Halter, Denis Flagellet, and uh, F.P. Jor. Mm. So they had this company where they did movement design and movement like for other big corporations. And this model for sure was done by THA, which later on was actually used in the Debatoon model for sure as well. When Danny Flagellet started Debitune, it was used in the DB1 or 2 model for sure. Mm. Yeah. I know. But that's so, not the end of the I story. Know Jan knows a lot about the background of THA. No, no, no. I only know this story because of Jack. Oh. So basically, okay. when, when, when Long Long was looking for it, yeah, obviously I was helping her and I was talking to Jack about it. And then he said, I was looking for this piece like half a year ago. And I was like, huh? You were in for this piece half a year ago? And he was like, yeah. And then I was like, oh, okay. Why were you interested in this piece? And then he told, and then and I was more interested in like, wh why did you not get it then? Mm. So Jack, maybe you want to shed some light on that. Well, if you have something terrible to say, it don't say it. <laughs> just say it. It's not really terrible, but it's interesting. Yeah. Oh, okay. I know what he's going to, I think I know what he's going to say, because I think me and Jack kind of discussed this. It's just whether you want to believe the beautiful side of the story or it's like, you just feel like. Why I didn't well, I don't it? think, I don't think it's whether it's the beautiful side of the story is that the story doesn't finish where currently the marketing does. Oh, yeah. Okay. Because the, the marketing okay. I feel finishes at, yes that perfect part of mm. THA yeah. was done by three independent watchmakers. How mm. wonderful yeah. and fantastic it was. But Jack, do you want to share more? So you're talking about how, what happened after to the movement? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So they sold it to this company called the uh, Jacquet SA, which was mm. found by this guy called Jean-Pierre Jacquet in uh, Switzerland. Mm. Uh, which the movement, because it's a movement manufacturing company. So later on, the movement was used in like some other watches as well. I think maybe Snardin or Jar Perigold used it. Mm. But I guess the interesting story is about this guy who owns that Jacquet SA company, Jean Pierre Jacquet. Uh, so I only read about it online as well. Apparently, he was involved in a bunch of criminal activities in Switzerland. He like, he had this, uh, he robbed like Rolex for like half a million Swiss franc worth of Rolex gold cases. And apparently the, like Rolex sent all these gold cases in for polishing. And then the owner of that store that does the polishing is in it with that Jack Pierre Jacquet, and then they took like a thousand gold cases from Rolex, and they just like robbed it. And, then, and there was also some story about like him making fake watches, Frank for, like big brands. Yeah, yeah, 
it was pretty crazy. It's actually, yeah. it's actually, um, you're being so polite. Like, what happened was, uh, when we say fake watches, literally, they were probably still real watches because the components were coming out from Frank Muller mm -hmm. and getting assembled by him, and he was still selling them. He was selling them to like, oh retailers. no, that was like, that was like. Frank Mueller's uncle apparently stole these watch parts yeah. and cases and gave it yeah. to him to assemble. And yeah. then I also heard he made some counterfeit like Richemont watches, either like yeah. Cartier or some other brands. But where do you guys hear stuff like this? It's on the net. It is? Yeah, it's okay. all on the net. So like, recently yeah. I've been, I guess like I was um Something eye-opening. I read online. I actually uh, posted it on the waiting list Instagram. Uh, it was about the crash um, because this uh, this guy uh, Charles he wrote about a very um, uh, educational post about the aftermarket prices of the crash for the past year, how they've absolutely just been skyrocketed, skyrocketed. Um, and then in the post, he was like, yeah, actually, like in the 1960s or like 1970s, if you were in VIP of, of Cartier, like you could get the crash. But then what people were doing is that they were outsourcing the movement and that jewelers were just making the, the, the case of the crash. So the watches had the movements, but the cases weren't stamped. So like, does that and that kind of just put it into perspective for me because I, first of all, never knew that this thing was, well, nobody really fact-checked it. I just kind of just believed him, believed him because of his background. But um, it actually makes sense because if you think about it, right, like you said that someone stole a thousand Rolex cases. If you just have a mold, I guess you can just stamp out the cases after the mold or if you ha actually, ha actually have the thing. And then if you could make a movement, you can actually make make a watch or make a dial so what does that say about you know maybe some of the pieces that were going on auctions or secondary markets um like maybe people don't know the backstory or where the watch has been but they're just selling these extremely like at extremely high premiums um yeah it's very well, i think the, the backstory is interesting for a few reasons first of all if you actually look at it vianney halter was very unlikely actually involved in the movement of the monopusher because he was there for a very short time. Mm -hmm. And then also, uh, if you also read it, like you kind of read between the lines, you actually kind of feel that actually the movement was actually developed by Dennis Philagelli. Mm -hmm. It's just that the company was owned by those three. So, um, and then also because you then get that narrative with Jacquet, mm -hmm. whereby and then you have a, an understanding of the watch industry from oh, actually, this is real life in the fact that we're talking about a country which basically makes watches. Mm. Uh, we're not limited to like watch houses. Some guys knows that guy. Some guys knows that guy. These watches are selling at retail. Maybe people are making a lot of money, mm. right? And people are thinking, how do I also make a lot of money? And I can know someone in the brand, get 20 cases and the movements, case them up. They're real watches. They're not authorized but I can then maybe push it onto the, the gray. Mm. And you know what? Sell it to retailers at a cheaper price than they're getting from the brand, mm -hmm. right? And make money that way. So you probably think, oh, that's actually probably did exist. That probably did happen because that's human nature, mm. right? But then that story continues more because obviously this guy, if you read about Jacquet, when he got caught, it wasn't like, you know how people they get caught it's because they finally got caught mm. so he he had track records of being sued but never mm. actually it succeeding mm. right so he kind of got off the hook but obviously we know you know there's no smoke without fire um he was yeah constantly a dodgy dodgy person but mm. still kind of you know since he actually bought Dude, i just want you to movement, know like he got out of the jail recently so <laughs> oh. I don't want him to come after us. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so he got in jail. Um, and then that movement, obviously Jacquet dissolved. That movement then got sold on to another company. Well, no, the company's still there. They just renamed it. And then they sold it to like 
citizen group, which is yeah. like part of citizen the group and whatnot. So now Citizen Group now owns that movement and that movement has been into more uh, standard watches, I should say. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So, so that's I guess the, you can the say journey. that there's been quite a bit of shame behind the development of the movement. But actually, when it got moved to the second really. time, I believe the movement was upgraded. So it's a better movement. <laughs> <laughs> so the better movements in the more standard watch. Yeah. Interesting. Right. Anyway, so you mentioned two watches earlier, Jack, which was the Roman Gauthier and Kari. I don't know anything about Roman Gauthier, really. Can you tell me about what's so special about his watches? Like, educate me so I don't have to read. Oh, I just think his movement finishing is out of the world. It's just mm. very, very, very good. And his chain fuse is also very interesting. Mm. Although I heard from people that it's not very reliable at times, and but hopefully, if I buy one, it stays reliable, <laughs> and I, I don't have to service it. But where does this uh, watchmaker come from? Do you know? Like, uh, what was uh, his training and stuff? Is he he Swiss? started in the uh, yeah. He's Swiss, and he studied uh, micro engineering or precision engineering in university. And so he started his company. I think they also do a lot of work for other watch brands, like outsourced work, because they're actually very good with the CNC machines and whatnot. Yeah. Okay. I've actually well, not seen the movement of the Roman Gauthier, but I'm looking at one now, and it's, it kind of reminds me of the Rishep Rishepi, um Chronometro Contemporain. I don't know if you guys can. Yeah. See that. Like. Yeah. I also uh, really right? yeah. like Rex Chef's watches as well. Yeah. So, do you like Cote de Genève or do you like frosting for movement backs? I like good Cote de Genève. Good. Good. Because <laughs> there's some bad ones. I was like, yeah, you might as well just not do it. Like, especially the yeah. ones with the machines, you might as well just not do it at all. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Very interesting. <laughs> Right. Well, that's been a very informative and quite enjoyable interview with you, Jack. You know, I can't say it was the easiest one, damn it. But anyway, <laughs> in fact, I want to know was... what Jack is like um, outside of this interview. <laughs> like, what is it like to oh. work with Jack? Use this chance to voice out your. Um, what is it like to work with Jack? Place. Yeah. I actually, okay. I actually like working with Jack a lot. He is a very reliable kind of guy. Yeah. To be honest, I'm one of those people that I don't need you to wake up at like seven like me. Yeah, but if I give you something to do, I don't care how you do it, just get it done. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I, it's, I don't know how, really care how much you want to live your lifestyle. But every time he's been given the work, he's done it and he's done it like um, quickly. Like I, I, I just give it to him and I don't have to chase up with him. I don't have to follow up on it and it's done. Um, another thing I like about Jack and his personality is because he's so laid back, he's almost half asleep every, every time. He's, <laughs> he's, I've never seen him perturbed. Like, mm -hmm. I've never seen him pissed off. So even when I'm pissed off, mm. and he's someone that I can really show my anger to, knowing mm -hmm. that he just, I hopefully, I don't know if he's going through any in, in, like interior turmoil oh, I hope yeah. Not. Yeah. but but he's like listening to it and he go and he just calms me down because eventually you know you're not getting the energy from him so you just burn yourself out a little bit and um <laughs> he i feel i can really talk to him honestly and another thing I, a trait about jack i like is one he does know his watches but second if he doesn't agree with you he has mm -hmm. no qualms in telling you he doesn't agree with you and pretty directly as well and okay. honest feedback is, uh, I think, always very welcomed. Mm. And also the way he speaks, right? I mean, if you listen to this guy, I hope, I don't, you know, luckily we're on this podcast because if, if the audience listened, they'd probably fall asleep by now. <laughs> you know, he, he's, his voice is so slow and like sloth-like. It, it just has a very good calming effect on the team. You Maybe know, especially I did the when... voiceover for that sloth in the... <laughs> What's that movie called? <laughs> Zoo? 
Uh, Zootopia. Zoolander? Zootopia. Oh, Zootopia. Zootopia. Zoolander. <laughs> what That's what you know. Yeah. So, so it's been, it's been a, uh, in that respect, yeah, it's been good to work. I don't with. think his voice is sloth like. I think he speaks with, he speaks slowly, clearly, and with conviction. He still, he obviously knows what he's talking about. Um, I think what you were go- going after, like the sloth, like maybe it's just like your one word answers, which is, to the point you know like it's there's no bs about it um which is but his lifestyle's a bit sloth like that's what i meant like <laughs> he's i think actually... it's just because it's winter mm, that's <laughs> shut up <laughs> that so is freaking such cold. a bs answer you say it's freaking cold yesterday yeah. so we're doing this interview and he was like okay uh i was so busy the last few days i said okay i'll call you tonight and i was like i couldn't do it so i was like okay i have to do it because the interview's tomorrow I'll call you tonight. And he goes, okay, what time? And I said, okay, uh, seven o'clock, eight o'clock. Anyway, we fixed the time. And then he was walking and I was like, dude, it's like minus six out there. Where are you going? He said, oh, I'm playing cards. So I was like, okay. And he goes, it's not cold. I'm like, dude, are you nuts? It's not cold. Minus six. Yeah, well, because I'm cold. wearing like a bunch of, like I'm wearing like a- Yeah, but it's the same temperature today. Jacket. And you say today it's like really cold. No, no like, if overall, you go outside- Because like, I'm not wearing a freaking down yeah. jacket at home. Yeah, when you go out and you're walking about, it's not that cold. But when you're at home, it's just so cold. Yeah. Uh, my my home is, I invested in a lot of heating equipment. So, yeah, hey guys, I was like, I'm about, not dealing with that. Don't talk about cold. I'm in Canada right now. Like, it's... Yeah, but you got heating. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, you what do you mean? It's not like you don't have You're heating in Singapore. Okay. Dude, well, it's so cold. In it's so cold <laughs> in AC. Singapore. Because of AC. I, Is it? Yeah, it's I, so I, cold. <laughs> like it's colder than Hong Kong. Like I'm just like I need to wear a jacket everywhere. Because it's so hot outside and it's so cold inside. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> At least like it, it just tells you like I'm wearing you two girls are wearing short sleeves. Right. Yeah. Uh there's yeah. no way I'm wearing a short sleeve. Yeah. And Jack is like wearing a like a full blown <laughs> yeah, sure. Oh, this, this is like a bear. Oh, <laughs> oh my god! I don't know why you put the cap on. You should just kept that on for the whole interview. Yeah. Right. Anyway, keeping with tradition, I've kept it a quick fire. All right. So, Jack, are you ready for the quick fire? Yeah. Okay. The watch that got away. Uh, FP joint Octa Reserve. Okay. Favorite piece of art and why? Probably Impression Sunrise by Monet because that's what really first got me into it because I was like, wow, this is like pretty next level. Okay. Most overrated watch? Frank Muller, especially the ones with diamond. <laughs> right. Best Shanghainese dish? Uh, Xiaolongbao. I agree. Oh, very quick. Right. Best restaurant in Shanghai. We also think Taipong. <laughs> it's not. Definitely. Taiwanese. I, yeah, I really I like know. this noodle place in uh, uh, behind uh, Ganghui where I used to work. There's like this noodle place that's like super cheap, but like it's really, really good. But I have a feeling maybe they're just adding, adding way too much MSG. That's why it tastes really good. <laughs> <laughs> right. Vancouver or Shanghai and why? Uh, it would be Shanghai for most of the time. But right now, I really want to go back to Vancouver and eat some food there. What food? Uh, I really like this restaurant called the Kisa Tanto in downtown. You got it. In Chinatown. And there's also like this jukes ch- chicken, fried chicken. Really think, good. Yeah, juice chicken. Yeah. Right. Best thing you like about China? Uh, the best thing about China? The food is very good. Mm. Okay. And the worst thing about China? Worst thing? Well, I'm still here, so I guess it's not that bad. I can't really <laughs> think of any. Right. If you came to Shanghai and only had like time to go to one place, where would you recommend? 
probably like Lu Jia Sui go to one of these high buildings, either like Shanghai Tower or like Oriental TV Tower, just so you can see the whole city. Right. I just want to say you've really sold Shanghai, mate. Um, you know, everybody wants to come now after hearing what you say about it. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, you know, so what, I guess, what, I guess other tourists, uh, other tourists, other tourist, or tourist places don't need to worry about Shanghai right now. Um, what would I say? One place right now, even though it's so cold, I do like walking around the French concession. Yeah, you know, the mm. promenades and the and the thing is quite kind of nice. And with the French concession, um, it's a place where you can like just walk and get lost. Yeah. So when it comes to like not nature, but just having I don't know, just quiet time, mm. it's nice. And there's also there's little a lot of stores. There. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of stores, there's a lot of leaves, um, little small boutiques that a non-branded that you can go in little potter and have a look at what they're selling yeah. some antique stores it's it's got that whole vibe i quite like and there's some good food there so yeah i like that I, kind of place i agree i agree i was in shanghai for two days in uh, january so a year ago around this time for a friend's birthday and uh so it was two days but then like really just one day because the second day i was like leaving in at noon um and then we went to the french concession place and then we were um there and so this was like before covid right like before lockdown uh, we went we were going through like these ceramic stores and um, places that, you know, really good coffee places and a lot of like vintage um, like Zhonggu Dian um, that were selling like secondhand used like clothing and, and shoes and scarves and the um, architecture and just the whole ambiance of that area. It's really, it's really cool. And there's a really good shisha place there too. Um, so uh, we got the best shisha place. Yeah. 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 All right. Jack, how many hours do you sleep a day? Like 10? <laughs> Whoa. Or <laughs> 10 or 8. Okay. That's a lot, man. All right. When will you get your Kari? Uh, depends when I get the money to buy it, I guess. Thanks for that. Very interesting would you, answer. Would you order it directly or would you buy it from the second market? I want an observatoire. So like the, the one that's before his current Von Weed production. Mm. So I guess I'll have to buy it from a secondary market because there isn't really, he's not making them anymore. Yeah, the movement on that watch is amazing, right? Like the winding sound is really sharp and clicky. Yeah, I think it's a piece of movement yeah. that he modified, but yeah. the finishing is really, really nice. All right. Well, thank you for Jack uh, for doing the interview, and uh, even thank you so more for you know for even waking up for it. You can go back to bed now. <laughs> like, just go back to bed. Okay. Actually, do I need to speak to you today? Probably, <laughs> but have a one one or two hour nap. Uh, good night, Jack. <laughs> yeah. Good night, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to all our listeners we'll see you on the next one bye 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 thank you bye Thank you for tuning in to the Waiting List podcast. Hit the subscribe button and the next episode will come straight to your phone as soon as it's ready. Whilst I'm here, please remember to leave a nice review and follow us on Instagram at the Waiting List podcast.